the first uh, of the seven lectures that are part of this first exam will cover nucleotides and DNA replication. So before we get into that, I want to briefly give you a foreshadowing of some amino acids you're going to need to learn. And so quickly we'll go through the, some tricks on amino acids on how to remember the 20. I have a, a listing here of the 20. And the easiest way to learn them is some people like to use flashcards. Some people like to use the, the 2020 version of flashcards, which is an app on your phone. But it's easier to learn them in smaller groups. Instead of memorizing all 20 at once, learn them in smaller classifications. Like these are the ones that are alcohols. There's three. These are the basic ones. There's three. These are the ones that are considered acids. There's two. These are the aromatic ones. There's three. And I guess some of these will be in multiple categories. Like tyrosine is an alcohol and aromatic. So you may learn it more than once, and that's fine. But instead of learning... 20 things, which is a large number of things, you can simplify it into small groups of things, right? For instance, when you're learning the acids, you're really only learning one. Aspartic acid, glutamic acid differ by one carbon. So once you learn one, you've learned the other. Just remember which one's longer. Same thing goes with the hydrophobic amino acids like valine and isoleucine and leucine. Once you learn where the branching is, you've learned all of them. Right? So it's not difficult once you learn a few. So that's the way I would approach these is, is learn them in smaller manageable groups than try to learn all 20 at once. Okay, So that's some practice questions for those. So on to nucleic acids and the structure here. Does anyone recognize the photo in the top right of the screen? Who is that? Jane Goodall. Right, Jane Goodall and some chimpanzee, I don't know his name. All right, so what is she famous for in this photo? Knowing about chimpanzees. Oh, sorry, I couldn't hear interacting you. Interacting with them, interacting with chimpanzees. So interacting, uh, that's a good way to put it. She, he's being very subtle. Consternation. So she's actually, along all those things you said are correct, but she was actually accepted into their society. You know, so chimpanzees, if you didn't know, are very, very much like humans, but they're also very much uh, not accepting of other organisms into their society. They generally kill outsiders, even from their own species, if they're not in their clan, right? So the fact that they didn't rip her arms off on sight is step one, right? But to be accepted into their society is amazing. Right. They actually gave her food. Right. Now, where was she on their societal social scale? She was below the lowest of the lowest person in their society. Right. They treated her as a pet. Right. But the fact that she got that close, she was allowed to or able to make all her observations, which was nice. So normal, normal, I guess not saying normal, but your average person, they would just kill on sight because right? you're an intruder into their, their territory. So, but humans and chimpanzees are very, very close as far as evolutionary connections and the amount of their DNA we have in common. Depending on how you analyze it, it's somewhere between 95 and 99% identical. We have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? 22 somatic chromosomes and then the X and Y pair. And they also have 24 pairs of chromosomes, 23 somatics and one pair of XY. You're thinking, hey, did we grow another pair of chromosomes somewhere? No. In fact, Human chromosome number two is a fusion of two older, smaller chromosomes, right? And in fact, we're so human-centered in the way we name things is we name our chromosomes one through 22 from the largest to the smallest in size. So just one, two, three, four, five, and so forth. And we're so human-centered on this that when we looked at the chimpanzees and other great apes like orangutans and bonobos and gorillas, look at their chromosomes, they have an extra pair. We don't label them 1 through 23. We label them 1, 2A, and 2B, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way through 22. Because their number 2A and 2B, which are much smaller than our number 2, is the same as our number 2. It's a fusion of those two at some point in our evolution. All right, we'll look at that at the very end of the slide set as well. If you want to see how that actually happened and how number 2 determines basically all the differences in the great apes. So what is DNA and RNA? Let's look at how it's put together. 
So looking at the bottom of the slide, we have a basic backbone of sugars and phosphates, right? And here's your typical biology drawing again with absolutely no reference for how it's put together, just that things are connected in some way and usually colorful. So sugar, we really mean ribose or deoxyribose in terms of DNA. And the phosphate, you know, it's really a phosphorus surrounded by four oxygens. And then the bases of one of five bases, whether it's RNA or DNA, is a subset of those four. And they're put together in this order, and the order matters. There's directionality to it. So the sugar, although here it looks like just a little pink wedge, one end is called the five prime end, where the carbon five prime is, and the other is the three prime end, where the number three carbon is and the phosphate bridging those two carbons. So there's a directionality to it. If I read these bases left to right, it's different than if I read them right to left. That is not the same strain. Okay, so we keep that nucleotide unit in mind where we have the, the sugar, the phosphate, and the attached base is the repeating unit of this polymer. We call that a nucleotide. Okay? So the main difference between nucleotides and nucleosides is the presence or absence, respectively, of a phosphate group. So if you just have the, the base, whether it's any one of the five bases, and the sugar, either sugar, connected, and that's it, we call that a nucleoside. If we attach one or more phosphates, we now call it a nucleotide. It's a very simple definition. Okay, and you've already told me this just not long ago, that in RNA, the sugar is plain old ribose, shown there on the, the bottom left, with one, two, three, four, five carbons. And then on the right will be deoxyribose, where the two prime hydroxy is missing. And in its place is just a hydrogen. Right. We went over our bases already. We have five bases, two purines, three pyrimidines. You already know how to tell them apart. We count the number of oxygens. I have a little handy chart at the bottom right there that lists those number of oxygens. So purines, adenine, no oxygen, guanine, one oxygen, pyrimidine, single ring, have either one oxygen, it's cytosine, or a pair of oxygens, and that's uracil or thiamine, thiamine possessing the methyl, uracil not. And you already talked about how these things pair with one another. A will pair with U or T, and G will pair with C. Okay. So here's a look at it when they're connected together. The bottom picture shows you the, the numbering system. And why do we keep saying three prime and five Prime. What's the prime all about? So if you look at the structure at the bottom, and by the way, which structure is this? Is this ribose or deoxyribose? Is it a purine or pyrimidine? Is it A, G, C, T, U? What do you think? The picture in the box. It's ribose with a guanine. It is ribose because of this OH on number two. And is this guanine? How many oxygens do you see? No. no oxygens, so it's, <coughs> it's adenine, exactly. So this is adenine with the ribose attached. We call that adenosine. You don't have to memorize these names, but the name changes slightly when you add the, the sugar, the ribose. So this is an adenine ring on a ribose ring. The adenine's atoms are numbered one through nine, right, in the rings, because there's nine atoms in those rings. And then the sugar, we can't simply call one through five again, because if I say, hey, look at carbon number three, you're gonna go, which carbon three? The one in the ring or in the sugar? So we need to be specific. So we call, oh, the ones in the sugar, we're gonna call prime. So if I say two prime, you know I'm talking about the ribose. But if I say two, you know I'm talking about the, the base. That's why we call them prime. So just to distinguish the two. So if you look at a bunch of these put together on the right here, Let's look at the RNA picture first. Is this RNA strand shown in the picture read from top to bottom or bottom to top? Well, let's read it five prime to three prime. What do we mean by that? Because you can interpret that one of two ways. If I look at any particular subset here, right, any, any repeating unit, that's gonna be my ribose. Let's look at the one in the center, the one in red, right? The ribose with the yellow base forward on it, whatever base it might be. And then its sugars, one, two, three, four, and five prime, are contained in the ribose itself. If I look at its number five and its number three, it goes from top to bottom, right? So this is the five prime carbon, this is the three prime carbon. So five to three is top to bottom. Same thing with the previous base and the subsequent base. I don't 
mean 5 to 3, as if in blue here, across the phosphate, because those belong to different nucleotides. So in the first case, the RNA is read top to bottom. In the DNA, it's also read top to bottom, because within any one repeating unit, 5 is above 3. Okay. If I have two strands that were to come together and bind to each other, they would pair running in opposite directions. So one strand, perhaps, is going top to bottom on the page, and if the bases were to pair with another, it would be red bottom to top, 5 to 3. So they go in opposite directions. Okay. So if you look at a typical unit at the bottom here, this is actually 5' prime ATP, or what's commonly just called ATP, right? The ribose itself, every carbon of the ribose sugar could potentially have a place to put a phosphate number one, number two, number three, not number four because it's in the ring, but number five, all of them have OHs on it, right? Why is it limited to only numbers two, three, and five, right? We can put OH, I mean, phosphate groups on any one of those available OHs. Number one is not available because that's where the base is attached. The OH has been removed as water. Number four's OH, while in the straight chain form, would have been available. It's now in its ring form, so we can't put it on number four. It's in the ring. Now, remember back to organic, when you have an alcohol and an aldehyde, and you put them together and make a hemiacetal ring, it's no longer an OH, right? We'll cover those again later, too. All right, so the only places I could possibly put phosphates are on numbers two, three, or five. If this were deoxyribose, that would be limited to just three or five, because the two prime OH would not be there. Okay. For instance, at the top here, we have ribose, and that's the anomeric carbon. That's where you came together and made the, the hemiacetal, right? And we could attach our base there. We're going to attach adenine in this case. And the adenine ring loses a proton, and we lose the OH group from the sugar, making the connection, and we leave water as a byproduct. Okay, so this is another condensation reaction. Okay, so the adenine and the ribose become adenosine, which is a nucleoside. If I then attach a phosphate, it would be called a nucleotide. Okay, so I gave you some practice questions here. Distinguish between a nucleotide and nucleotide. I just did that. The two purines and three pyrimidines, we've kind of beaten that to death over the last two hours. And looking at the bottom compound, is this a nucleoside or a nucleotide? How do you tell the difference? Nucleoside. There's no phosphate. It's a nucleoside because no phosphates, right? Is the sugar ribose or deoxyribose? It's ribose because of the presence of the 2 prime OH. And the base is which base? Well, let's narrow it down. It's only a single ring, therefore pyrimidine. How many oxygens does it have? Two. Two. So it's either thiamine or uracil. Does it have a methyl group? Thiamine has a methyl group? It does not have a methyl group, so it's yes. uracil. uracil. Exactly. So this molecule overall would be what? Not a uracil, but a uracil attached to a ribose is called uridine. And you don't have to memorize the name. You could look it up. But it's the nucleoside version of uracil. It's the uridine. It's attached. If I stick a phosphate on it, it would then be a nucleotide. Okay, so those aren't too bad. Right, so let's, let's put some numbers to this. The molecules have polarity. We said 5 prime to 3 prime. These molecules can become very long. Let's look at a very simple case. It might not seem simple at first, but it is rather simple. Let's look at a bacterium E. coli. Its DNA is one big loop, right? It's one big circular chain. It has 4.6 million nucleotides in it. Right? That's a large number of nucleotides. If you were to write it out, it would take many, many sheets of paper, even in the smallest font, right? But that is minuscule compared to the human genome, which has roughly a thousand times that much DNA, right? At 3.2 billion nucleotides. The difference is there is all of one single strand. It's one continuous piece of DNA for 4.6 million bases. Ours is segmented into 23 pairs, so 46 pieces. But yet, we still, our smallest piece, chromosome number 22, 
the smallest piece of DNA, is still about 10 times larger than all the DNA in the E. coli, right, at 50 million bases. Our largest is five times that at a quarter billion bases. So yes, we have much larger pieces of DNA and many more of them than E. coli do. So let's look at some more numbers on the DNA. So on the right is a little rotating diagram of the double helix. One strand is going top to bottom, the other is going bottom to top in five to three directions. And the still version, you can see that there's some features to this thing. Okay, the first feature you should notice is I colored the two strands, blue and red. Right? Let's say the blue strand's going down, the red strand's going up, and they're coiling around each other in this double helix. Okay? They're not coiling evenly. Uh, what you see in the shaded regions in the center are the base pairs. And I know you're used to seeing them where we showed it in the last slide set, where you're seeing them face on, where you can see the, the flatness of the rings, right? So if you hold your hands out in front of you and put your palms facing you, one will be a pyrimidine, one will be a purine, pretend one hand's bigger than the other. And then they base pair with each other through your fingers and this hydrogen bonding. What you're looking at here is if you take your hands as you're looking at them and turn them edge on so you can, can't see all your fingers, you're just looking at the edge of your hands. That's the base pair orientation you have here. So they don't look so big, they just look flat. But you notice they are flat and they stack on each other. And it's better shown in the rotating diagram. You see how the base pairs come together and they stack on each other. Okay? But because they don't stack exactly on top of each other, there's a slight tilt to them, it forms this groove in the DNA. There's actually two grooves. So in one, you see there's this, from the edge point of view, there's this major cavity here this major groove. It's a really deep indentation. And if you look from the side, right, you can see how deep it is. And then there's a smaller groove, right? And from the front facing of our diagram, you see that the blue and red, like heavy blue and red pieces are closer together in one area and wider apart in the other. So the part where they're really wide apart and deep is called the major groove. And where they're closer together and more shallow, the minor groove. The other thing you can see is if you turn it on end and look at it, there's no empty space down the middle of this thing. It's all packed, right, full. There's no area, there's not a tunnel, there's not a pore. It's completely packed. Now, because the bases are facing inward and the backbone is on the outside, this thing, it's, it takes a while to make a U-turn, right? It takes a long way to turn all the way around. We'll see later that proteins are the exact opposite of this. They can make turns really quickly. But this thing is, it's like turning around a large truck. It needs a large turning radius. So if you look at the diagram where I labeled this measuring stick of 34 angstroms, it's where from one point of the molecule to another point, it's now repeating. It's turned around 360 degrees. It's twisted one full rotation. If you look at that, it takes 34 angstroms, or basically the width of 34 hydrogen atoms, is the gap covered by that complete turn. That's actually a rather long distance to turn around for a, for a molecule. In that turning around, there's 10 base pairs, right? You can count them. If you count all the base pairs, there'll be 10 of them. So let's do a little math. If it takes 10 base pairs to turn completely around, that's 360 degrees, right? How much is each one turning on the next? So ask a different way. If I take one base pair and I look at it from above and I put the next base pair on top of it, how much is it twisted to the one below? 36 degrees. 36 degrees, right. So I take the 360 degrees turned completely around. It took 10 bases to do that. So each one did one tenth of that or 36 degrees. And another question, if it takes 34 angstroms to turn completely around in the linear sense, like along the axis, and it took 10 base pairs to reach across that distance, how far is each base pair from the next? 3.4 angstroms. 3.4 angstroms. We call that the rise. So it takes 3.4 angstroms to go from one base pair, center of one base pair, to the center of the next base pair. Okay. So I would remember those numbers because that's your typical average DNA. It's got a major groove, which is really deep, it's got a minor groove that's more shallow and less wide. It takes 34 angstroms to go completely around, and it takes 10 base pairs to do that. So all the numbers should come from remembering 34 and 10. 
So another thing we can talk about is what holds this DNA together? It wasn't just between the base pairs. That's our hydrogen bonding, like shown on the right, a GC pair having three hydrogen bonds and an AT pair having two. But it's more than just hydrogen bonding holding it together. Right? So if you imagine those base pairs you see on the right again, turn it horizontally and they start stacking on each other, these bases are very hydrophobic. Right? There's carbons and nitrogens in there. Right? There's not a lot of bonding partners. There's no OHs and there's no NHs in the, the rings. So these things are flat and hydrophobic, so they will pi stack with each other. They're aromatic rings, so they will pi stack, much like benzene rings do. So that pi stacking actually forms the gap between the two. And if you remember, pi stacking occurs at about what distance? We have our 3.4 angstrom gap. Okay. We also have very negative charges in the backbone, right? All the backbone is covered by sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate. Every phosphate has a minus one charge. So if they want to get anywhere near each other, we're going to need to counteract those charges. So the DNA is not just found naked. It's often found associated with other proteins and magnesium ions. So the magnesium ion will counteract those negative charges and allow the DNA molecules, the two strands, to get close together. Right, so let's look at an experiment that shows how DNA is replicated. Right, so this was done back in 1958. Let's start with the figure on the far left. It's a, just a drawing showing how DNA divides. So we take a single parent molecule shown in blue here. The two strands come apart, and each strand serves as a template for the new strand. In fact, when they come apart, each has all the information that the original molecule had, even though it's only half the molecule. Just because it has half the pieces doesn't mean it doesn't have all the information. Every time there's an A, it would know to put a T on the other side if it's replaced. And on the opposite strand, there's a T and it knows an A was removed. So every daughter strand has all the information to make another copy so I can get double stranded again. And that repeats and repeats and repeats. But you notice the original strand never goes away. It just gets diluted in the process. Everybody see that on the left? The red strands represent new raw material that came in to was polymerized to make another copy. But the original blue strand remains. So in the first generation, we have two hybrid molecules, right? Half original, half new stuff. And then in the second generation, we have, again, two hybrid molecules, but two brand new molecules that are made only of new material, right? From the original start. So our original molecule is diluted away. So they wanted to prove this was the method. It was a semi-conservative replication. So the way to do that is you take your original DNA, DNA molecule, and it's made mostly of normal isotopic nitrogen, N14, and occasionally you have the heavier isotope, N15, an extra neutron in there, and it weighs ever so slightly more. So if you have it in there, slightly more dense nitrogen, and you make a DNA molecule out of it, it'll have a slightly higher density ever so slightly higher. But you can take advantage of that. You take a little centrifuge tube, as you see in the center, and you fill it with a salt called cesium chloride, which is a very dense salt, and you mix your molecules in there, spin it at very high speeds in a centrifuge, and they'll migrate to their appropriate densities through this salt solution, right? Very, very dense salt. And then you take a, this little centrifuge tube, which is made of plastic, and you poke a syringe in it, you pull out your DNA because it's radioactive, and you can run it on a gel and you can see how much of each is there. So what they did uh, was you take the initial solution, or initial DNA molecule, and make it completely out of N15. So you grow bacteria in a, in a source of nitrogen that is only N15, and they'll make all their DNA out of that. It'll be completely N15. On the graph there, it shows generation zero, all at that band, right? You see the bright or the dark band for N15. No N14 present. Then we start letting it grow under normal N14 resources. We give it urea or amino acids or whatever the nitrogen source is, and it's all N14. We let them grow. And after one generation, we still see a single peak. So at the 1.0 mark, we still see a single peak. But it's not under N15 anymore. And neither is it under N14. It appears halfway between the two. Well, that indicates that it's composed of half N14 and half N15. That's our first generation data molecules over here. We let it go to the second generation in this, in this experiment. They took a measurement just prior to that. 
And you notice we see two peaks again, right? One of them occurs directly under N14, and the other under the hybrid again. And they appear to be of equal density or equal prominence. And if you, you graphed it, you see their two peaks are about the same intensity. That represents our second generation of molecules, where we have half the molecules are the hybrid case, original and new, meaning N15 in blue, N14 in red, and we have two that are made of fully N14, right? And this is where most textbooks leave off this figure, but it's important from a, a scientific method point of view and to teaching this to you that how do you know that they didn't just take their gel image and slide it to the left a little bit to make this figure, right? Because you see these are different experiments. They're different gel plates. They're not from one big plate. How do you know they didn't just slide it to the left and make it show what they wanted? So this isn't the true image. This is the actual image from the paper where they show many generations. So they go all the way through the fourth generation. But I want to show you two things out of the actual image here from the paper. So if we go beyond the second generation and go, to, say, to third generation, and I want you to imagine doing this over here on the left of the screen. If you take this second generation of molecules and moved on to a third generation, what would they look like? Would there be any red and blue hybrid molecules in our third generation? Would there be any totally red molecules? Would there be any totally blue ones? What would it look like in the third generation here? So imagine each of those strands coming apart, and then each strand gets attached a new red strand to it. So there'll be a total of eight double-stranded pieces there. There'll be two hybrids and six new. It'll be two hybrids that look just like these two, right? And it'll be six of them that look double red, right? Absolutely right. So let's say how many in the second generation here, the hybrids to the totally reds is a one-to-one -one ratio, right? There's two hybrids and two reds. And that's what you see over here at generation two. We have two equally bright bands or equally dark bands, equally intense bands. And the graph shows that the two peaks are the same. Third generation, he just told us there'd be two hybrids and six all reds. What's the ratio then of all reds to hybrids? Three to one. Three to one. So if I looked over here on my graph, I should have three times the intensity of all N14 to the intensity of hybrid and no all N15s. So if we look down the third generation, there's nothing under the N15 line. And the densities of these bands or the intensities of these bands is kind of hard to tell from the image that this one's three times darker than that one. But if you measure theirs and plot them on a graph, you see this peak is three times as high as that one. In reality, it's not the height of the peak, it's the area under the curve, if you remember that from your organic labs. But this is three times as much as this one, which makes sense. Speculate what would happen if I went to a fourth generation. What would be the ratio of all reds to hybrids? There would be eight total molecules in the third generation. There would be 16 total molecules in the fourth generation. <laughs> So it'd be, four, seven to one. it'd be seven to one. There'd be still two hybrids, but 14 double reds. So the ratio would be 14 to two or seven to one. And if you look at this picture at the fourth generation or just slightly past it in this experiment, this is roughly seven times as dense as that one. So area under the curve, seven times this one. But my question originally was, how do I know they just didn't slide this around? I never see more than two bands on here. How do I know it's where they think it is? We have to do controls in their experiment. So we take the zero generation mixture, set it aside, throw it in the freezer, save it for later. We take some of the 1.9 mixture, mix the two together, and run it on a band, run it on a gel. And I see three bands. So I know this zero generation band and these two bands from 1.9 do not overlap. That's how they knew how to line these up. And in fact, you should do this with the zero and every other one you did. And I'm sure they did. But it was sufficient to show that if you make zero with this one and zero with the 4.1, that you're getting three possible banding patterns, right? And about by the time you get down here, right, there's almost none of the hybrid left, and that's shown in the picture, and he lined them all up 
for that reason. So only showing this picture, which they do in textbooks, leaves you to doubt was this forged. It's better to show the entire experiment with the controls. Why they do that might be for space-saving reasons, who knows, but from a, a purely scientific method point of view, I want to see the controls. Okay. Right, so I take my two strands of DNA, and how do I get them to come apart to do this thing? Well, in the laboratory, we can heat them up to almost boiling, 95 degrees, and what's holding them together is just hydrogen bonding. We can overcome those many weak interactions, and they'll come apart. This is called denaturation, or melting, or thermal melting. And if we let this solution cool down, will they come back together? Yes. And they'll come back together in the proper bonding arrangements. The two strands will go right back together because that's most favorable. And we call that renaturation or annealing. Right? And we can do this over and over and over. Now the cell kind of had a, a veto on that idea of that's how I separate my strands because I don't want to heat my cell up to 95 degrees every time I want to do this. That would be very good for the rest of the molecules in the cell. So how does a cell get the strands apart? It don't, doesn't heat it up to 95 degrees. Right? So what the cell does is there's proteins that come along and pull the strands apart. They're called helicases, right? Because they undo a helix, right? We'll talk more about those in just a second. But let's look at this helix, right? We said we have our, our normal DNA, our distances were 34 angstroms, 10 bases to turn around. But what I was describing when we went over those numbers was B-form DNA shown in the middle picture at the bottom. So B-form DNA, you can see the major groove, the minor groove, the backbone showing the blue and yellow, and then the white or gray showing the base pairs in between. Okay? A-form DNA looks like you took B-form DNA and twisted it tighter, right? So most of you don't remember this, but phones used to have cords, and you can find one in a museum. And if you take one, like I used to do when I was a kid, my parents didn't like this, and you take the cord and you twist it tighter, what happened to it? Well, hopefully you didn't break any wires in it because your dad would be upset. But if you twisted the cord tighter, take any kind of helical structure and twist it tighter on itself, it tends to get shorter and wider. Right? So if you look at A-form DNA, it looks like I've taken B-form DNA and tightened the twist. So it goes from 34 angstroms down to 28, it's been shortened, and it's gotten a little wider. You notice it's not as, as sleek and slender as the B-form, it's a little wider. And the two grooves look more like each other now. You can still pick out the major and minor groove, but the differences between them have become less distinct. Right? There's not a clearly major and minor. The two grooves are almost the same. Okay? And that occurs when DNA is dehydrated. When you lose a lot of water connections to the B form, it condenses into the A form. And lots of proteins look for this form of DNA rather than the B form to detect dehydration. Right? The other one is Z form. And no, it's not from extra hydration. We're not going the other extreme here. But Z-form is unique in that it only takes or adopts this form when certain sequences are present, generally lots of G's and C's in a, short, a very short span. So we call it GC-rich regions, tend to adopt a Z-form DNA. And it's really odd. It has this weird left-handed turn to the helix. The grooves are non-existent, really. But certain proteins will look for a Z-form DNA because they're detecting a certain sequence. That's how they find it. Okay. okay, so let's take our DNA one more time. Let's put it in a circle, make sure like, like the E. coli's chromosome was, right? It could be a large or small circle, it doesn't matter. And should we have a micrograph here showing that? And if I take that DNA and I want to make it more compact, since it's in a circle, if I take the strand, pull it apart, twist it one extra twist and put it back together, the strand will adopt a different shape. Okay? It won't be so relaxed anymore. If you ever do this, take a, a circular thing, right? maybe a rope that's put into a circle, add an extra twist to the rope, and then put the ends back together. You'll notice that the entire structure will form a super coil on itself. It'll twist the opposite direction. You just twisted the strands and form a super coil on itself, like a, a twist on the entire molecule, like at the bottom right of the figure. So here, I've turned it two extra turns, put the strands back together, and then let it hang, and it will twist on itself in the opposite direction.
instruction twice to relieve the stress. It's called supercoiling. And so what happens is E. coli, and we do too, some of these, not so much in our, our big chromosomes, but say in mitochondria, where we have circular DNA, we add these extra twists. And look what happens to the DNA from being relaxed to supercoiled in the micrograph. It takes up far less space. So this is a way of condensing the DNA so it fits in smaller spaces. Okay. The enzymes that do this are called topoisomerases. Let's go back to our words again. Topo meaning topography or changing the landscape or shape of the thing. Isomer, it, I haven't added or removed anything to it. It's still an isomer of itself. I've just added a twist. Right? So topoisomerases are enzymes that change the topography without adding or removing anything. Right? And let's take our DNA from a typical human cell. It's about 3.6 meters long or nearly 12 feet of DNA. That's a lot of DNA. Remember, it's many, many, many bases. It is in 46 different pieces, but how do we get it all to fit inside of a cell, but not even just inside of a cell, inside of a nucleus, which is smaller than the actual cell? So we have to compact it somewhat. And we can't just take the DNA and smush it into a ball because it has all those negative phosphates that don't want to be anywhere near each other. And we can't just throw in a bunch of magnesium either because then it would just precipitate as a salt. So we need to find a way to make it more compact. So that's where nucleosomes come in. So these are little proteins called histones. And the DNA will wrap around them. The DNA being negatively charged wraps around a histone, which is positively charged. So what amino acids would you use for that? Well, some positively charged ones, our basic ones, so our lysines and our arginines and somewhat histidines, will wrap around it. So much like the seams on a baseball. Imagine the, the baseball being the histone protein and the DNA being the seam wrapping around the baseball. And then there's a little linker, right? And then we wrap around another baseball. And then a small linker, and then we wrap around another baseball. And this goes on and on and on. And when we're done, this collection of protein and DNA is called chromatin, right? It's about half mass protein and about half mass DNA. Okay. But we're not done there. We can take those beads on a string and compact them together and put them in a little bag. Think of it like a bag of baseballs, but more like tennis balls in this case. But the DNA is following the seam of each of those balls from one to the next to the next to the next. Right. Then we take those and stretch them along a very long bag and they just form a long strand with a bunch of beads sticking off. And this is called a chromosome, right? And it's highly, highly compacted DNA. The problem is, if I keep it all in that form, it's sort of inaccessible. So I need to open it up occasionally. And we'll talk about how we do that in a future lecture. On this slide, I don't think your slides have this because I added this recently. But if you type that into Google, you'll find it. It's a, a link to the DNA Learning Center, and it's a video on how this DNA is packaged. So it's a really good video explaining the figure right above it. So if you just Google the text I put on there, DNA Learning Center, how DNA is packaged, you'll be able to watch that very short two-minute video. Okay. So let's move on to RNA, talk about the different types of RNA real quick, and then what the differences between them are. So you've probably heard of the first three here. We have ribosomal RNA, abbreviated rRNA, transfer or tRNA, or messenger mRNA. The largest of these is the ribosomal RNA. Right? It's thousands of nucleotides long. So the, there's more than one rRNA. There's a large one, a small one, and intermediate ones and so forth. But we're talking several thousands, like five, six, seven, twenty thousand nucleotides long when they're combined together. So this is a very big piece of RNA, and it accounts for the vast majority of RNA in cells about 80%. Let's skip tRNA for a second and look at messenger RNA. It's the next largest in size, right? And this is the one that carries the information about how you assemble the protein in translation. And on average, it's about half the size of the rRNA, 2,000 or so nucleotides. Some are longer, some are shorter. Obviously, it varies because it varies with the length of the message, right? The bigger proteins need a longer message. This could get very short. It could be only a few hundred nucleotides if it's a very small protein. And then lastly, tRNAs are the smallest, about 100 nucleotides or less in size. And these are the ones that carry the activated amino acids. We'll talk about what activation means later to the ribosomes for synthesis. 
So all three of those have what in common above. And don't say they're made of RNA. I get that every semester. And yes, you're right. I agree. It's not what I'm looking for. What do those three have in common? Think functionally. What do they have in common? Like the nucleotides that make up them, or? Well, no, they're all made of RNA. That's true. But what do they have in common functionally? They all are a part of fill in the blank. Protein synthesis? Protein synthesis, right. They're all involved in protein synthesis. In fact, the rRNA is the ribosome, right, with its associated proteins, but it is the ribosome. And then the tRNAs are the, the linker between the two. Messenger RNA compares, contains the information on how to assemble the amino acids. But that's not the only RNAs in a cell. We have what's called small RNAs as well. There are many, many, many of these things. We'll talk about some of them later. And they have catalytic activity, or they associate with some protein and act as an enzyme as well. So many types of RNA are not necessarily involved in protein synthesis. So keep that in mind. Okay. So RNA isn't just single-stranded, and DNA isn't just double-stranded. Both can adopt both, can adopt both types of uh, molecules, double and single-stranded. And even with a single chain, we can adopt a double helical structure like the ones shown below. So a DNA and RNA can form what are called stem loops or hairpins, right? Because they look like little hairpins. So a stem loop contains the very two things in its name, a stem shown in red here, and a loop at the top connecting the ends of the stem. And what do you notice about the stem itself? They are base pairing, right? So A pairs with T, G with C, and so forth, A with U, and so forth. So these things pair according to their proper pairings and form this little stem. Why does it do this? Because being in a double-stranded formation like this, a double helical nature, is far more stable than just being open single-stranded. So keep in mind, RNA and DNA can do this. Now imagine you were a protein, and your job, your role in life, is to recognize a piece of DNA. Right? And your job is to not recognize it by its sequence per se, but how would you actually recognize DNA? Proteins don't read bases. They come along and they grab the thing. If it fits, it fits. If it doesn't fit in its pocket, it's not the right piece. So if you were a protein trying to grab this DNA molecule, what two features about this little stem loop would you be concerned about? The bulb. The bulb at the top, the loop? The each stem. One? Okay, so what about each one of them? You're absolutely right, but what feature of each one would you be concerned with? And I'll give you a hint. It's not the sequence. The size of the loop? The size of the loop and... Clarity? Uh, not so much. Keep in mind that it's not shown in this drawing, but when you have a double-stranded double feature there, it will be a helix. It will be twisting on itself. And they're always right-handed twists. So it's not so much the the polarity of the thing, but the size of the loop and the length of the stem. So could you imagine if I had a mutation in this DNA? Let's say the, the T at the top left in red, at the very top of the stem where it meets the loop, let's say we change that T to a G. Would it pair the same way? If I make this T into a G, it would not be able to pair with the A opposite it. And so our stem would get a little shorter, but our loop would get a little bigger. And you being that protein looking for a specific size stem and loop would not recognize it. So it's not so much the sequence here, it's the size of the stem and the size of the loop, or the length of the stem and the size of the loop. Now, what if I made that mutation to a G, like I said, but on the other side, I mutated the A to a C? then it would look exactly like this, as far as your protein was concerned. It's the same size stem, it's the same size loop. So a correction mutation on the other side could still make it accessible. Right? This is not so much what protein it codes for, 
or what stop codon might or might not be there, but this is what epigenetic does it recognize, right? What protein would bind to that thing on the surface because it adopts this shape or because there's a particular methyl group attached here or something like that. That's in the realm of epigenetics, which you do inherit. Okay? And the same thing could be said for RNA molecules on the right. They look for a certain size stem and length loop. Okay, let's talk about DNA replication real quick. There's lots of DNA polymerases. We'll talk about only numbers one and three because they have the highest fidelity and do the majority of the work. Uh, polymerases two, four, and five are mostly involved in repairing errors that are found in the sequences or breaks in the chains or missing bases or things like that or UV damage or something. So we'll talk mainly about one and three, but even those, one and three, have the ability to fix some mistakes. For instance, polymerase one can remove a base. It has this five prime to three prime exonuclease activity. What does that mean? Well, let's look at the word. An exonuclease. Nuclease is an enzyme that cuts nucleic acids. In our case, not ribonuclease, but just nuclease, so we know it's DNA. And exonuclease, as opposed to endonuclease, it cuts it on the end, on the exterior, not the interior of the molecule. So this 5 prime to 3 prime exonuclease activity, in other words, means it can be... In other words, means it can remove a base from the end of a chain on the 5 prime end. That's all it means. DNA polymerase 3, on the other hand, has 3 prime to 5 prime exonuclease activity, which means if it makes a mistake, it can back up and remove the last base it put on because that's on the 3 prime end. Right? All nucleic acids are made 5 to 3. So when it's putting the next and last base on, it's on the 3 prime end. And so polymerase 3 can back up and fix its mistakes. It's on the old typewriters that I grew up with, where if you made a mistake, you just hit the backspace on your keyboard today. But we had to hit this big white X on the keyboard and the ribbon would move up and another hammer would come up and hit white ink on your page like 10 times and it'd scare everybody in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And then you had to blow on it to dry it and you could type your letter again. But you guys have electronic keyboards now. But it can back up and repair a mistake. That's what polymerase 3 can do. Polymerase 1 doesn't do that, but if it encounters a log on the tracks, Right? If it's coming along, it's making its DNA, and there's a base already attached in front of it in the way, it can remove it. Right? And this is used for primer removal, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Okay? So all these DNA polymerases make DNA, but they must read a template. They have to be told what to put next. They're just machines. They need instructions. So every DNA polymerase needs a template. Okay? They also cannot start de novo. They can't start from scratch. That means a DNA polymerase can't just sit down and say, I want to start on this piece of DNA. There's a template there. I see a base. It's an A. I want to put a T across from it. It can't do it. It can only take an existing strand and make it longer. So we have a problem. How do we get it started? Right? How do we get any DNA replication started? Well, to the rescue are... RNA polymerases. So RNA polymerases, which make RNA of course, do not need primers. They can just hop on a piece and start making it. So they save the DNA polymerase. The DNA polymerase is handicapped in that way, where it can't start de novo. A little RNA polymerase will come along and put a little piece of RNA, and then the DNA polymerase will say, hey, get out of the way, I've got this, I can continue from there. Right. Okay, so here's how that works at the bottom. Look at the very bottom. We have our, our semi-conservative replica replication going on again. Pull the two strands apart. At the very bottom picture on the left, we have the template laid out at the bottom. We're reading the template, 3 prime to 5 prime, and we're making the new strand 5 to 3. So the next base that goes on here, when the polymerase reads this, it looks across from the empty base and says there's a T, an A fits here, my raw material is DATP, that's the deoxy version with the ribose, and then ATP sits in this spot, 
right? We have an attack from one molecule to the next. We'll talk about those in a minute. We lose a pyrophosphate. That's the latter two phosphates of the three of ATP, right? Because it's adenine, ribose, excuse me, adenine, deoxyribose, phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. We lose the latter two, and the first one, the alpha phosphate, gets incorporated into the chain, right? Then it moves on. It looks at the next base. This is processive. It looks at the next base in the chain. It says across from a C, I need a G. Give me a DGTP. It puts that in. Across from the A, the next substrate would be DTTP, and so forth. So it's reading along, putting bases in, 5 prime to 3 prime. Okay, so our template's on the bottom, red 3 to 5. The growing DNA strand is made 5 to 3. Why does this reaction move forward at all? What's the, what's the impetus or the energetic reason it moves forward? I'm taking a DNA strand, I'm putting a negatively charged nucleotide onto it, getting two negative charges closer together. This does not seem favorable. How do we get this to happen? It's by the release of this pyrophosphate, this PPI, which is two phosphates put together. If you think back to our earlier lecture, two phosphates attacked together is a phosphoanhydride bond. And it's fairly certain you're going to run into a water molecule in the cell. It's always raining in the cytoplasm, and it's always raining in the nucleus in these eukaryotic cells. So this pyrophosphate will immediately be destroyed. Right? It gets broken into two individual orthophosphates, and that's irreversible. That drives this reaction forward. Okay. Right, so we do this. We require a primer, an RNA piece to come on first. To get it started, the DNA can continue from there. Right. So how do we go about the chemistry of this? Well, let's finish this, this part here, and we'll pick up here next time. So how do we finish the chemistry here? This is the base of the sugar, or, or the base and the sugar and the phosphate, which would be above this, of the strand that is already there. Okay, This, this piece is already ex on the, the DNA. On the right here, red from top to bottom, three to five, is the template strand. So whatever orange base is, green base pairs with it. Next would be the yellow base. Whatever that is, purple pairs with it. Who cares what they are, but it's the correct pairing. Okay? Here's my incoming nucleoside triphosphate, right, with whatever appropriate base is there. The three prime hydroxy, notice no two prime hydroxy, this is DNA. Three prime hydroxy does a nucleophilic attack on the phosphate releasing the two latter phosphates as pyrophosphate, which subsequently de degraded. That leaves this connection as a phosphodiester bond. Okay? So a fairly stable bond. Right? The pyrophosphate gets immediately hydrolyzed so that it can't come and undo that reaction. This base now becomes the last one in the strand. The next base comes in and we continue over and over and over. So the DNA strand gets the, the polymerase moves down the template strand, putting on the new bases as we go. Ahead of it, we need to unwind the strands, and behind it, we need to rewind the strands, right? Well, rewinding them is easy because they're base paired now. They're going to come out the back end as two separate double helices. Not a problem. In front of it, I need to unwind the strands. So my topoisomerases remove all the topography problems, the supercoiling and things like that, and then the helicases come in, and unwind the two strands. Yes, this requires ATP, not as a piece to be put in, but to power the process, right? So the hydrolysis of the ATP powers pulling the two strands apart. And once they're pulled apart, we don't have to put them back together because they're going to become two new strands. And what if you make a mistake, right? Sometimes you type the wrong key on the keyboard. It should have been a G and I hit A. I can back up and there's an editing site in this thing. Remember, it has that exonuclease activity the three prime to five prime activity. It puts the base in the editing site and it will not fit in the editing site unless it's wrong, which is how it knows if it's wrong. If it's correct, it won't fit in the editing site. It's kind of clever. So it cuts off the wrong base, try again. If it makes another mistake, it keeps trying again. Occasionally, one of these does not get repaired and that's how we get mutations. Okay, so the last part, we'll talk about how we do this for multiple pieces of DNA, like really long pieces of DNA. So E. coli, we said 4.6 million bases. It can copy all of that in less than 40 minutes. If I sat you down at a keyboard 
and asks you to copy 4.6 million letters every time you see an A type T, every time you see a T type A, G type C, and so forth, you could not type 4.6 million letters in 40 minutes, right? Well, yeah, that's not how E. coli does it either. It's got a whole room full of keyboards doing this. We start all over the text. If you want to copy 4.6 million letters, we're going to use quite a few keyboards. But still, 40 minutes to copy that is insanely fast. Okay? So how does it do it so quickly? We start at multiple places. How do you know where to start? Well, it must be sequence dependent. And in fact, it's those little sequences that are called ORI sites, or origin of replication sites, that a particular protein, DNA A, recognizes. So it goes and finds it and sits on it and says, I found it, and puts up its hand. DNA B comes along, it's a helicase, and says, thank you for finding this, I'm going to pull the strands apart now. And then I need to keep the strands apart, which is an excellently named protein. We'll get to some poorly named enzymes later, but an, the best named protein ever, the single-stranded binding proteins. What do they do? The name's obvious. They bind to the single strands and keep them from coming back together. Then our RNA polymerase called primase comes along, puts on a little piece of RNA there, and the DNA polymerase says, thank you, I can take it from here, get out of the way, and continues from there. Say you do that on a circular piece of DNA. You go all the way around, are you going to encounter where the other one started? That's as far as you have to go. But there's a piece of RNA in the way, right? Because that's how we started. Remember, our RNA polymerase can remove that little primer, and then we use DNA ligase to seal the NICs, and E. coli is done. Whole thing's copied. Our problem is we have linear pieces of DNA. We don't have circular pieces. So when we get to the end, we can't copy it. If you pull the two strands apart, I have no information on how to copy the end because I can't go the other direction. So if you look at the bottom right figure, these are called Okazaki fragments. Uh, the way this figure is going is I'm copying the DNA from right to left. I'm pulling the two gray strands apart. The leading strand is being made 5 to 3, red, the template, 3 to 5 on the gray. And I can just follow along as this gets pulled apart. However, on the other strand, DNA is only made 5 to 3. So as I pull it apart, I have to do it in little short segments in the other direction. When I get to the end of the strand, there's a problem. Right? I can't put the last pieces together because there's nowhere to start. And I'll show you a picture of that right here. Uh, let me get to it. Right here. So if I pull these strands apart, right, and I get to the very end of the strand, I'm going on the lagging strand. I have to put a little green primer and then the pink or red DNA. Then I can remove the green piece and fill in the gap. But at the very end, I can't add any DNA here because I would have to start beyond the end of where there is a template. So how do I solve this problem? If you don't solve this problem, the DNA gets shorter and shorter and shorter every round. This is telomere shortening, right? And this is one aspect of aging. So back in the early 80s and 90s, they thought, well, let's use telomeres, add more telomerase, the thing that fixes this, and we can solve aging. No, in fact, that's how cancer cells do it. Cancer cells are immortal. They don't die. They keep replicating without loss of DNA because they overexpress this telomerase. So how does this telomerase work? So on the right here is a picture of how it works. The green strand is my original piece of DNA. The telomerase is a protein that comes along and it brings its own little blue piece of DNA. It's a very short piece of DNA. It's you know nine bases long. And it holds it there. And it puts it against the green strand and says, hey, look, this matches. We have some base pairing going on. I can extend the original strand a little farther out. That's the red piece. Then the blue piece, if you can imagine detaching from there, sliding down a little more, reattaching, and extend the original strand, extend the red even longer. Detaching, moving down, reattaching, extend it even longer. Now what I'm adding is repetitive nonsense. It doesn't mean anything, right? It's the same stretch over and over and over. But at this point, when I've made it longer, I can now hop on and copy the strand in the other direction, making sure I copied all the green relevant information. Yes, it could be longer than it was before, but I haven't lost any valuable information. And when I'm done with this, that red strand could be quite long, right? But it's very rich in Gs. It's a lot of Gs in that strand. That's the idea. And at the very bottom of the slide, you notice it could wrap around on itself 
and base pair within itself. And that protects the end from being degraded. That's how we protect the ends of linear DNA. Right, last thing I want to show you is a reminder from the first slide is how, to be, how are we sure that our chromosome number two is a fusion of the other two chromosomes? Well, let's look at them in more detail. This is chromosome number two on the left from a human, and this is a chimpanzee's 2A and 2B lined up. And the sequences are almost identical if you line them up. So clearly at some point, they fuse together in the separation as the speciation for humans and chimps. Right? Why didn't that happen with other organisms? So let's look at the chimp in the middle at 2A and 2B. If we have some kind of crossing over event, right? If you look at the, the event A reversal there, the blue part on 2A gets flipped around and it becomes the 2A we see in gorillas, right? That sequence of DNA has been flipped around backwards. And that's how the gorillas look. If we look at the orangutan DNA, that also happens. So clearly orangutans and gorillas have a common ancestor. If we look at the 2B, the gorilla DNA, again, there's another inversion, has become the top of the 2B for the orangutan. So that's the distinction of the speciation between those two. What happened with humans? Well, the, the chimp 2A and 2B had regions that were very similar, right? And what happened is we had a crossing event there where they fused, right, into a single piece of DNA, right? Much like I showed you earlier with the um, holiday junction where two pieces could be swapped in strands. If you don't undo that swap, they become a single strand. So they were fused. And over time, what was the centromere of 2B, 2A and what was the centromere of 2B mutated enough to not be recognized as centromeres, and what were telomeres have been mutated to a centromere. So our 2A, or our 2, is definitely a fusion of 2A and 2B.